So, yeah, I mean, our interests really overlap, but I'm going to drill down much more on these three cases that I mentioned, try to contextualize them, compare them, at least in a preliminary way, with ten other uh, public sector, higher ed, non-tenure track faculty uh, that have unions. So, so in a, uh, I guess I'll just move on to the first slide here. So. The numbers, the latest numbers from AAUP are actually even a little higher. The non-tenure track share of the total U.S. Uh, higher ed faculty are now up to 72%, according to them. Uh, the trend has been steadily in that direction, right? If we went back to the 70s, it would have been maybe 20% were non-tenure track. So they've completely inverted at this point, or almost uh, in that space of time, as neoliberal restructuring has really hit our higher education institutions like it's hit educate, like it's hit the entire economy. There really is no part of our economy that is not subject to that. Um, that's been associated, particularly in the last, I would say, 15 years, with a lot of organizing among non tenure track and graduate student unions in Michigan, where I've been based for 20 years now. And by the way, I should just indicate that in addition to like teaching as a non-tenure track faculty member in the residential college and the sociology department in Michigan, I'm also the president of the non-tenure track faculty union. And I'm the president of the local AFL-CIO as well, the Area Labor Federation, uh, Huron Valley Area Labor Federation, which encompasses Washtenaw County, where U of M is, as well as three other counties. So I come at it partly as an academic who's been studying labor movements for well, since I did my dissertation on Canadian and U.S. labor movements back in 1990, but also now in the last couple of years as, as a president and, and someone who helped to build this union. I mean, I've been involved in LEO, which is its name from the beginning. That's 15 years ago that we formed LEO. So I, I've got those dual lenses that I bring to this work. Um, so my question here is really, you know, can these kind of unions that we've formed really make a serious impact in transforming this precariat into something that has livable jobs, livable wages, but also some of the other things that go along with professionalism, like a certain kind of autonomy, a certain kind of security, a certain level of respect, uh, a bunch of things that are less tangible in money. I'm going to mainly focus on what collective bargaining outcomes have meant for money, but actually there's a whole set of non-monetary issues to be explored as well, and I'm very interested in those. We did bargain about some of those and happy to talk about them, even though this presentation won't have much to say about them, per se. Um, Goldenberg and Cross, two, two uh, faculty members from the University of Michigan. Uh, Goldenberg was the dean of LSNA, our biggest school, languages, science, and the arts. Cross was her finance guy in LSNA. Wrote this book, Off Track Profs, in 2009, which I think is one of the most systematic efforts to analyze the formation, the emergence of this sort of very large now majority group of non-tenure track faculty in higher ed through a close comparison of nine cases. Uh, I think it was nine or ten. They have one chapter on unions, which is rather disparaging and annoyed me when I first read it. Um, and you can see why. They think that unions really can't make much difference in terms of compensation. And they have these three arguments that I've set out here. One is that the industry, the sector, is very competitive, so there are really no oligopoly or monopoly rents, which, of course, is one argument for how unions used to be able in the industrial sector, which they're constantly comparing higher ed and the service sector that it's a part of with the industrial unions. Um, um, also, secondly, that, of course, strikes have been outlawed. Michigan's one of those uh, states that outlaws strikes, so that according to them, denies us access to the most potent form of collective action available to unions. And finally, a kind of normative argument that non-tenure track faculty wouldn't strike even if they had the right to strike because of their commitment. You can see the quote. You probably read it by now. So basically, we don't want to do that to our students. All three of these arguments are really problematic. <laughs> um, you know, the University of Chicago and the University of Michigan are immensely rich. Um, richer than God was the way these SEIU organizer, Larry Alcott at Chicago, described them. They have an endowment of $13 billion, and they have many, many students lined up for every one they admit. As long as they have that kind of situation, they just keep raising tuition. As long as they keep raising tuition, they generate big surpluses at the expense of those students 
Uh, and, you know, we did serious research on the budget of our university, University of Michigan, as part of the preparation for our round of bargaining, the fifth round of bargaining that we undertook, we began last October, just about a year ago. And we discovered that, lo and behold, in the last two years, the University of Michigan had been running a over $500 million, half a billion dollar surplus of income over expenses. This has nothing to do with their endowment, which is like 11 billion and which generates $330 million worth of revenues that they take out of the profits that they make through their investments each year. It has nothing to do with the massive hospital complex that the University of Michigan owns, which has almost doubled in size. They're buying up clinics and hospitals all across the state of Michigan. The University <coughs> of Michigan is now the fifth largest employer in the state. The only bigger ones are the big three auto companies and the state of Michigan. After that is the University of Michigan, fifth largest employer. In Washtenaw County, one in every three jobs is directly related to the University of Michigan, and God knows probably another third of secondary employment is So this is a massive employer, an extremely wealthy employer. Chicago is nearly that big, but it's extremely wealthy also. So there's plenty of rents to be found, if that's the terminology you want to use. But even where they aren't, like community colleges, we did a lot of work with our colleagues at the Washtenaw Community College down the road, and they pay their faculty a whole lot more than these non tenure track faculty who are being paid at University of Michigan. Even though they run on a much tighter budget, they don't have the kind of capacity to, to you know, generate rent that Chicago or, or, or Michigan has. So it's a bogus argument anyway that the only way in which unions can matter is if there are rents to be tapped. Unions can matter if they alter the priorities of the administration and how they allocate a fixed pie just as easily as if they capture a share of rents. Um, maybe not as easily. Maybe it's easier if you've got those rents, but it's not, uh, it, it matters. I mean, the, 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 the salaries that the, that the community college faculty were able to generate, not just in that one, but across the entire state, were, were almost double what our members were getting in terms of our minimums anyway. And uh, the averages were actually even higher. The ratio was even higher. All right, so the second argument strikes being illegal, of course, when we were formed, and, and Goldenberg should have known this since she was the Ellison A. Dean at the time, we went on strike for a day. We had to. They were, we were stuck. Bargaining was stuck. We weren't getting anywhere on core issues. We struck for a day, and all of a sudden, those issues were negotiable. So, you know, you violate the law when you, when you have to. It's a question of civil disobedience. If it's an unjust law. It's a law in violation. It prevents all public higher public education, K-12 and higher ed, from striking. It's violation of the ILO, of the basic ideas of what our rights of freedom of association, collective bargaining, and right to strike are, which says that only if there are essential services involved, you, can you restrict that right or take that right away entirely, which is what our state purports to do and has purported to do since mid-90s. Ask West Virginia if you think illegal strikes, uh, you know, illegality stuff strikes. Um, and the faculty teaching mission, that is a big deal. I mean, we have never engaged in open-ended strikes. We've never even talked about them because our members don't want to go on an open-ended strike. They might go for weeks and weeks and weeks. <coughs> the Graduate Student Union, formed in the mid-70s, went on a five-week strike in order to get recognition from the university. So it has been done in this sector. But our members, I think, would be very, very, that would be a very heavy lift. Happily, you don't have to strike that long. Two-day strikes have made a big difference. GEO, the Graduate Student Union and, and that we share offices with and work closely with, has been doing that on a regular basis. In the time I've been at U of M, they've struck three times. So, you know, illegal strikes are a little bit riskier than legal strikes, perhaps, but uh, we do them when we have to. Um, and the dedication teaching mission is really... Uh, all about, well, what is that mission? What is threatening it? And can the union and pursuing uh, a collective bargaining regulation of, the, of this workplace, of this profession, in a different way from what's been going on, actually strengthen the quality of teaching that we do? And we, we argue that it can and does. Um, so as long as your members are persuaded that that connection is there, that by, by creating more stable jobs, by creating jobs that have a living uh, pay rate, you can deliver higher quality education to the students, then they, of course, there's a short-term inconvenience, but the bigger picture is you're actually a win-win. You're actually helping the students as well as ourselves. So, all right, uh, I, 
I want to talk about like these three cases, and I want to think about why do they uh, represent? What does it take to win big in this area, such that you could actually change the the very polarized nature and significantly reduce that polarization uh, for the good of all kinds of people? McAlevey would argue you need good strategy, and she really stresses deep organizing versus mobilizing and advocacy. I can get into what those are, but I suspect quite a few of you already know McAlevey's work. Level of community support. She talks about the Chicago Teachers Union and the dramatic gains they made and the fight that they were, took on mayor, uh, the mayor of Chicago and all the rest of it. Um, and in that context, parents were key. I think in our higher ed context, it's actually our students that are key. When they're with us, we are much more powerful than when, than, than when they're not. And finally, the credible strike threat, which she would argue, I think, is mainly about those two things, the intersection of those two things. She does talk a lot about compliance costs, though, this concept that, you know, we can win our demands with less power if the demands cost the employer less. So the greater our demands, the greater power we need. Um, but compliance costs are not just about the scale of the demands in the absolute sense, it's also relative to their overall resources. Uh, so we'll be talking about that. So that summarizes her account. And now I want to try to apply that account to our three cases. So University of Chicago Fordham and University of Michigan all saw raises in minimum salaries greater than 40%. That's pretty rare. I don't know. I, I, uh, we certainly, we never achieved that before at the University of Michigan, but I think it's pretty rare. And the 10 comparison cases are intended to try to determine just how rare it is. And so those are the, ca the cases we've looked at. I won't state them all, but you can see them there. I picked these 10, and I probably could have picked another 10 or 20. I don't know exactly how many would meet all four of these criteria, but these were the criteria. I wanted to be able to compare R1 or R2s because these three cases are all in one of those categories, Chicago and Michigan in R1 and Fordham in R2, at least 25 full-time non-tenure track faculty, um, a union, of course, and a collective agreement, and try to have some variation among states. So there are eight states represented by these 10 cases. So here's the setup at these places. Um, Part-time, full-time, non-tenure track faculty at Chicago, 150, similar at Fordham. And here, in, when I talk about University of Michigan, to keep it simpler, I'm only going to talk about Ann Arbor campus. That's the, that's the main campus. It's by far the richest campus. Their philosophy, and what's one of the things we'll be challenging over the next year, is that each campus is kind of a, a tub that must stand on its own bottom from a financial point of view. The budget systems are entirely separate. And so it makes some sense, even though that's kind of an artificial imposition, to, to look at campuses. And, and so I'll, I'll talk about Ann Arbor today. So just focusing on that one, there are two others, Flint and Dearborn. You see we have quite a few more non-tenure track faculty, and the ratios are somewhat different. Fordham is, relies very heavily on part-timers. We rely in Ann Arbor more heavily on full-timers, rather more like Chicago in that way. Um, Here's what the contracts that were negotiated in 2018, all of them are 2018 contracts, will be bringing uh, course rates, which is really what part-timers typically are paid by the course, and so course rates are the relevant measure for them, for full-time and part-time by the end of those three-year contracts that we three unions sign. So you can see 8,500, 8,000, and no difference at all in part-time and full-time. I can get into why that is if you're interested. A little bit of a difference in Fordham and a big difference in Chicago uh, in terms of whether you get paid as much per course by being when you're, when you're part-time or full-time. That's the scale of the increases. Here's a couple of other ways of looking at it. What's the, what was the mean full-time non-tenure track pay average this is derived from IPEDS data, federal government data that each university is required to supply in standardized categories. Back in 2010, this was the average, these were the averages, and you can see that the three we're looking at were a little ahead of the 10 comparable institutions uh, average. By 2016, though, University of Chicago had fallen behind the average. It was non-union up to this point, of course, so there's a, these are unionized and they are gradually improving. Chicago, ununionized, is falling. 
Fordham ununionized is rising, and University of Michigan, which had a union throughout the period 2010 to 2016, is rising. So there's some convergence going on among the union, all of them are pulling ahead of the non-union one at that time. Looked at in real dollar terms of the change, you can see 10% decline in real dollar pay, average pay for full-time non-tenure track, and pretty much stagnation for the other two union ones in our case study, and a little bit better for the 10 comparison units. By the end of this period, 2021, the minimum full-time pay will be will be this, 51,000 in Ann Arbor, 64,000 in Fordham, 60. So substantial increases, I haven't been able to calculate these yet. This is a little bit difficult to get because it's not in the contract. We're looking at actual average outcomes. Wow, it's hard to read that up there. Sorry. Um, I should have bolded these, I guess. What? No, it's 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 better it's here. Yeah. Aren't supposed to see those exactly. ones, but they can. Okay, we don't good. So yeah. Okay, can. we're all right. <laughs> um, right. So, but one, even without being able to look at those comparisons, I mean, it's pretty impressive that you can get the minimum <laughs> for these folks up to what the average was prior to this. Right. That that is a major leap. That's another way of thinking about 40, 67, 48. In other ways, we got the minimum up to where the average was before. Okay, how, did, how is that achieved? And then, did, well, one other point. In addition to those measures, which apply to mainly to newer people who are coming in at the minimums, right? They make, it's where they impact most. Longer serving faculty also made major gains at University of Michigan for sure, and I, I, I haven't been able to really explore in more detail Fordham and Chicago yet, but at University of Michigan, they went up anywhere between 3,000 and 12,500, depending on how many years of seniority had just added to their base pay. So, so I, having been there 20 years, got the second highest raise of that, of that nature, equity raise, we called it, basically for to compensate for past exploitation is the way we framed it. The administration had a slightly different way of talking about it. Um, so, so I, you know, I had a base pay rate going into this of something on the order of mid seventies, and I got twelve thousand, uh, eleven thousand five hundred added to that. Um, that's pretty substantial. So that's going to show up with some pretty major movements in averages when we do get those calculations done. Um, okay, so how, to what degree does McAlevey and the categories that she provided with us uh, that we looked at earlier help us to understand this? Well, interesting. I mean. How much deep organizing was there at Chicago? Not too much. They didn't really do a very good job for the first two years. They struggled after getting certified for two years without a contract. The guy that I talked with, Alcoff, Larry Alcoff, who eventually ne negotiated the successful agreement that we've seen the results, came in when the, they fired his predecessor and he had to redo things from scratch. And in the short period that they negotiated after he took over, they didn't really have much time to build what the previous uh, effort had failed to do. So they were rather weak from the point of view of deep organizing going into it. Fordham, these are first contracts, by the way. Unlike University of Michigan, for what we're talking about here is the fifth contract. These were the first contracts. So they, they literally, they got certified and within a few months they were bargaining. And in Fordham's case, within four months of beginning bargaining, they had the agreement that generated those results. So as, as Larry put it to me, we didn't have time to do deep organizing. Yeah. We didn't have time either to do coalition to building. To be fair, they did organize the Pope to get, didn't they have a strong Catholic? Well, Fordham is a Catholic, they, and they, not just Catholic, it's a Jesuit institution, yeah. which is the, the branch so that of was Catholicism deep, where deep they organizing take, where they it takes those just a little more seriously, the Jesuits, but yeah. he said that that with the administration made very little difference. That yeah. They didn't take that. And, 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 and that, that is also actually parallel with the University of Michigan's public mission. The people in the administration and the people they appoint to bargain don't, they have no real sense of what that might be. Right. That might involve yeah. some notion of justice yeah. uh, and the broader mission of the university. It's but the boards matter. And this is something that the, 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 the um, okay, one minute. So the elected board at the University of Michigan of Regents ended up being an important factor, uh, and so also I think did probably the board at Fordham, which were reachable with these kinds of moral arguments rooted in Jesuit and Catholic uh, social uh, philosophy. No strikes at any of them. 
So, you know, basically the, art, the key factors that we would be led by Math Levy to think, well, these, if you did these things, you'd be really powerful. Except for us, we did a lot of deep organizing. Uh, they weren't met by these cases. So what else could explain them? If it wasn't that, what, what else could explain the non-U of M cases? Right? I think U of M is more easily understood in terms of McAlevey's categories. Um, well, one thing that McAlevey, of course, talked about was cost of compliance. And so I did some calculations. How much did it cost? Let's say, let's just say, and this is an outside parameter, it's higher than what it would really be, that every single one of those full-time FTEs at Chicago, roughly 175, was paid $100,000 total compensation. What actually would that represent of Chicago's budget? And here's the answer, 0.35, less than a third of 1%. Uh, Fordham, it's bigger, 7%. U of M, the actual cost, I don't have to do parameters and guesswork. I know exactly what they were from our negotiations. It was about 2% of U of M's uh, $4 billion, uh, million dollar, uh, billion dollar, sorry, um, general fund <laughs> budget. So compliance, was relatively easy for, especially for Chicago and Michigan. Although Fordham is the one that's hardest to explain. It's the worst. It's the. It should have the lowest amount of power from McAlevey's understanding of things, and it does as well as the other two. So, uh, but it, but even if you think compliance costs are relevant, and I do, uh, nonetheless, U of M had, you know, our university had low compliance costs in every round of bargaining we've done. We didn't do nearly as well in rounds two, three, and four as we did in five. Even so, that so compl low compliance cost just creates a potential for a major victory. It doesn't get you there. It just means it's possible for the university to concede that relatively easily if you produce enough power to extract it from them. Um, and and then Fordham, of course, uh, you know, is the is the biggest anomaly. So I'm probably almost out of time. But the key, I think, is good strategy. Um, and I laid out what we did because it's you know as because we have several not very effective attempts at bargaining that didn't achieve very big outcomes we can look at well what did we do differently in round five that resulted in such a different and better outcome than in rounds two three and four of bargaining i couldn't get all of that onto a screen and we don't have time to talk about it anyway but I made copies of this, and I'm mm -hmm. going to send it around so you can take a look at it. There might be just about enough copies, maybe not quite. I'm going to keep one for myself. And, and I don't know, at a later stage, let's just try to get this over to these folks here. In this process, we can talk about what, what we did differently and why that was so important to the outcome. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.